Greetings everyone, BJ Weiler back with you for another fantastic episode of Awesome Sauce for Games. After a long, long absence, uh, this one has been. But it's good to be back. Where are we talking about today? Well, the title says it all. SWOTOR is dead. Yes, indeed. Star Wars The Old Republic. The uh, only Star Wars MMO currently on the market. Uh, that has been around since December 2011. Just celebrated its fourth birthday, did it? Yes, indeed it did. And now, thanks to some major changes brought by Game Update 4.0, yes, Swotor the MMO is pretty much a dead on arrival at this point. And now I can hear all the fun, boys. Yes, you're all raging and frothing at the mouth, spitting at your computer screen. How dare you, hater? Star Wars is doing fine. Look at the fun nonchals. I see 2,000 people on the fleet in 10 different instances. It's not dead, you fool. Well, dead is all a matter of perspective. Yes, indeed. SWOTOR, the MMO as we know it, died with Game Update 4.0. It is dead. The game that we played from December 2011 to October 2015 no longer exists. And it's been going under, and it's, it's been going under plenty of changes before that, but this probably is the biggest change that the game has experienced up to this point. So now, what do we have now? Um, really, I don't even think Bioware knows what kind of game they have at this point. Um, it's one of these things that you'll find mentioned every now and again um, by pundits and people who talk about games and this and that. Um, about the MMO genre in particular, um, about trying to satisfy too many um, elements of the player base, and you sort of dilute what your game is. Now, a lot of MMOs have been going that route um, over the years. Um, some call it the wowification, the dumbification of MMOs, but that's really a separate, um, separate entity. It's a part and parcel of it, but not entirely... Um, that's, in particular, uh, what this dilution is about. Essentially, dilution is trying to merge or meld all sorts of different game types and game styles into one game, which is, you know, virtually impossible. Can't really do it, because a lot of these game styles and a lot of these gameplay preferences are diametrically opposed to each other. So what you end up having is a game that is barely a jack-of-all-trades and a master of none, instead of certain games, say like EVE Online and some really core niche games, that focus on one specific element, even like mobile, MOBAs, excuse me, mobile online battle arenas. They focus on a small core segment of a gameplay feature and focus on that, and they don't have to worry about all this other fluff and nonsense and everything else, and uh, they tend to be a little bit more masterful at what they do than, say, your typical MMO that tries to incorporate a whole bunch of different elements and really can't um, do any of them to a particular, well, i got a collar sticking up here, particular um, masterful perfection, so to speak. So what we end up is a game that does a lot of stuff, but none of it's really all that great. You just winking at me. Yes, anyway. So what does this have to do with SWOTOR? Well, SWOTOR has changed its focus from um, being an MMO or a game that doesn't necessarily encourage group gameplay, but one that um, eliminates the need for group gameplay even further. Now... I'm all for that in a certain aspect. Um, I've played MMOs for many, many years. Um, I am a fan of many different MMOs, many different types of MMOs. So, um, 
and all of them each have something that I particularly enjoy um, that keeps me playing. So, that being said, I am not opposed to, or nor have I been uh, opposed to, MMOs um, giving many different players many types of options. Now, of course, I've just said that trying to incorporate all this stuff kind of dilutes your game, but that's more along the lines of different gameplays like PvP, um, interior designing, PvE, um, end game, quote unquote, um, which can mean many different things in all reality. Most people consider it raiding, but that's not always necessarily the case. There can be a lot of activities that you can do at end game, i.e. max level, that doesn't necessarily involve progression rating. But that is one core element. Now, I've always said on the forums long ago that uh, sometimes I think SWOTOR would have been better off if PvP and maybe even endgame progression rating had been completely eliminated from the game. And Bioware just focus on what made the game great. Um, you know, focus on what they do best, essentially. Um, give the game focus on the main bullet point, which was the storyline of the game in the Star Wars universe. And, um... Partly, that is because, well, obviously, despite what you may read, despite what you may hear, despite what some certain segments of the gaming community might say, um, hardcore rating, end game progression, and PvP are really niche elements, are really minor elements, and I, I believe we've even mentioned this in previous episodes of Awesome Sauce. It's really niche elements uh, and a minor portion of the gaming community that actively um, participates in these events to a certain level. Now, of course, there's going to be a lot of people that actually play PvP. I do myself, but I do not consider myself a PvP player. I've played Endgame in other games before, but I do not consider myself a raider, um, so to speak. But those, I, I enjoy playing all segments of a game. After all, I spent my 60 bucks on it. Why wouldn't I play it? Everything that that game has to offer. So, um, it just, it still does not, I mean, when you get down to the nitty gritty of it, even though a lot of people may participate in those activities, there's only a very small segment that dedicates their gameplay experience to those activities. The PvP players, the elite players, you know, and game raiders, so to speak. So they're a very small segment. That's not to say that they still aren't a somewhat important segment of a game, but it's just that a game can survive ultimately without one or the other of those elements being a part of the game. An MMO, surprisingly, uh, where you believe it or not, an MMO can actually survive without having PvP at all. I believe there are a couple out there that actually do that. Same thing with some end game raiding. Um, I believe there are some games out there that don't have progression raiding, but they do just fine. But anyway, what I was saying is that I am not opposed to a game offering players the ability to play in a manner in which they prefer, in which they find most enjoyable, which, you know, I've said in previous episodes as well. Now, that's a little bit different than sort of catering to certain segments of the gameplay population. It's an option, sort of like you know, having options in a character creation screen. The more options, the more personal you can make your character. Well, it's the same way with actually playing the game. The more options you have to play, um, the more options the game gives you to be able to do something that you find fun, the better the game is overall because it can attract a lot more people. And it gives those people the ability to play the game um, in the way they enjoy it most. And as we all know, people who enjoy playing a game are going to keep playing it, or eventually, you know, MMO-wise, especially in this free-to-play um, cash shop era, they're going to be spending more money on the game. So, 
while you don't necessarily want to dilute your game by trying to cater to a whole bunch of different elements, you do want to make sure there are options within what you do do for players to be able to enjoy what you do offer. So where does that bring us to the fact that SWOTOR is dead? Well, with game update 4.0, we have seen Bioware actually get back to their roots and get back to the roots of the game itself by focusing uh, a large part of the resources on creating a whole new story, um, which they have titled Knights of the Fallen Empire, which is sort of an episodic um, adventure that's going to be continuing on um, throughout pretty much all of 2016, um, as far as we can tell at this point. In fact, um, they have already released... Uh, the first nine chapters were released when 4.0 dropped. I believe there are supposed to be 16 total chapters in this first um, season, so to speak, of Knights of the Fallen Empire. So when 4.0 dropped um, in October of 2015, they released the first nine chapters, which took all of about 10 hours for people to play through, uh, if they were taking their time. Uh, I, of course, have seen reports where some people only took a handful of hours to complete the entire storyline. So in and of itself... I, I actually, when I first heard the news, I actually praised it. I said, finally, we're getting back to our roots, even though it's not quite the roots of the game, which were the bread and butter, the eight individual class stories, the eight unique stories that you got um, for the eight different classes. But nonetheless, it's a focus back on what attracted many, many people to this game to begin with, myself included. But, again, now we see, of course, the drawbacks to that system, and much like at launch, where people, the, the content locusts essentially blew through all those stories, or one or two stories that they wanted to focus on, and then complained that there was nothing else to do in the game. Well, you can't always base, uh, and you should never base game development on content locusts, so uh, they can all rot in the nether world, as far as I'm concerned. But, of course, um, people like to use that as a reason to see why the game quote-unquote failed initially and had to go free-to-play within its first year. Now, I've never subscribed to that. Was it part of it? Yes, sure, of course, that was part of the reason, but there were many, many other elements to why um, the game... Uh, performed or failed to perform as it did in its first year and eventually made this move to free to play which essentially showed that uh, SWOTOR really was a very strong and successful game. Overall it was more the business model than it was anything um, within the game itself. But here we are, we're back um, where we were almost four years ago to where now there's a focus on story and there's pretty much nothing else coming along in the pipeline that we have seen so far. So obviously anyone who um, has you know been in the game or played the game uh, for any length of time in recent history knows that PvP is all but dead uh, simply because it has been completely neglected um, since the major expansion, Galactic Starfighter, um, which, you know, you either like it or hate it, even among P PvP players, says the success of that expansion um, is still a little bit up in doubt, depending on which side of the fence you fall on that one. I particularly, um, I thought it was good. Um, I enjoyed playing it, but it, again, I'm not a PvP player. It's something I'm not really going to focus a lot of my time on doing. So, um, you know, it was it was new and shiny. You know, when, when, once the gloss wore off, it's like, eh, okay, I can take it or leave it. And then, of course, now we have end game rating. Now, most of the focus of the game after initial launch was building up those elements of end game as well as doing, you know, the usual MMO stuff, such as uh, quality of life improvements, bug fixes, and all that stuff. But for most of the four years of the game's life, it was all focused on non-story element games. And uh, so when when 
Knights of the Fallen Empire was announced, I, you know, I personally thought, well, now, finally, we're get everybody else has gotten their update. You know, PvP even had some updates here and there. And we even had one big old update for the interior designers, for God's sakes. And now we're finally getting back to what made SWOTOR SWOTOR, which was the story. And not just, you know, of course there were, you know, you know, Rise of the Hutt Cartel and Shadows of Revan, which gave us a little bit of story here and there. But nothing really as big as that we had, you know, at the launch of the game, so to speak. Those that big massive story that we could play through. Well, Knights of the Fallen Empire brings that, and I thought that finally, you know, I agreed with that. I thought that was a good focus for this expansion. Um, and part of that is because that they did make some other improvements along other areas of the game, such as some changes that they made to Endgame and uh, Operations and Flashpoints to where you will now be able to play Operations and Flashpoints, in which you can now, at any level and be justly rewarded for them. And some of the back-end things that they changed to be able to keep operations and flashpoints relevant over time as new and new things are added. So I thought that was a good foundation to bring in along with story and it's understandable that we wouldn't have an operation because obviously doing a lot of that back end stuff takes a lot of time. But then, but then, despite all the positives that Knights of the Fallen Empire brought initially, including the big old 33% jump in um, subscriptions at the t around the time and shortly after the time of the announcement. Then we started digging into the nitty gritty and we discovered that not all was as good as it could be. Now, first of all, of course, again, you know, there was the update to the operations, the end game, and stuff to make it more relevant. But again, nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing for PvP. Which, I mean, despite my personal feelings on the PvP, and again, I'm saying that, you know, I personally think the game would have been better off without it, it's still an integral part of the game at this point. The game was built with it, it's an integral part of the game, and it's one part of the game which Bioware has continually been dropping the ball time and time again. And it makes me wonder why there is any serious PvP you're still playing this freaking game because what Bioware has done to PvP or in most cases not done to PvP is an absolute joke. And to uh, to borrow a uh, and to uh, mention what uh, Larry Everett a uh, writer from Massively OP and formerly Massively as well as um, game streamer and um guest host on um, the Old Republic uh, Game Breaker TV's um, old uh, show focusing on the game. Um, what he, he said, uh, to paraphrase, I believe, was just to blow up PvP and get rid of it from the game, which at this point might be the best course of action to uh, to um, I know, just just at least put PvPers out of their misery, much like people who want chat bubbles. But anyway, so that's the first sign. Of course, the second sign is that the, there currently is no information. Now we might be getting information um, further along about operations. In fact, at the initial announcement, Bioware said there's no new operations until 2016. Um, but again, you know, they've said a lot of things that not necessarily have come to pass either. So perhaps within some of the upcoming live streams, we will be getting information to where they are actually working on a new operation. But again, you know, it's been well over a year uh, since we've had anything brand new in operations. Um, and again, like PvP, even though I don't think it should be a main focus of the game, it still needs to have some sort of focus for the people who enjoy that part of the game. Um, as small a group as they are, they still play an integral role uh, to the health of the game and to the overall longevity of the game. And, and, and in the end, those MMO bits... Um, those group activities um, are what maintain the longevity of MMOs. 
even if it's just a a crafting system um, that is a little bit you know swotor crafting is a little bit um, on the light side but if you look at the MMOs that have an integrated and, and deep as opposed to shallow crafting system um, that's end game in and of itself as well as, as I mentioned earlier you know a lot of people think of end game as raiding but there's a lot of other activities that can be considered end game crafting being one of them again now like PvP and like raiding crafting I can take or leave I really don't care about it but I cannot deny the fact that like interior designing there's a certain segment of the community that finds those activities enjoyable and taking everything all together helps the longevity and health of the game and again it's something that's been slightly ignored by Bioware but uh, they have made some updates to it but whether you like those updates or not you know you've again you go to the forums you hear different things from different people some crafters like it some crafters do not but a lot of it seems forced sort of like this alliance thing that uh, has come a part of um, Knights of the Fallen Empire to where after you go through the storyline you lose all your companions and part of the alliance system is regaining those companions back and I think we finally see what Bioware's version of Better Than Cross Server is which is forcing people into PvP in order to gain one of these companions now of course you can say well you don't really you know they're optional you don't really force this and that but that's basically just a question of semantics i mean if you want the companion there's no other choice there's no other option to get the companion but to pvp and that's a pretty poor way to um, lock pve content behind a gate there because essentially companions are PV, a PvP element. Much like the original Guild Wars locked away PvP elite areas behind needing to do PvP content. That was a big complaint about the original elite areas, the Underworld and Fisher of Woe. Where you cannot access those areas unless you PvP to get your particular region favor of the gods, which then opened up passageways to those areas. So, ArenaNet eventually learned that, you know what? Yeah, maybe that's not such a good idea. So, why not uh, take away that gate and allow PvP, PvE elements, excuse me, PvE elements to be the unlocking of those passageways, much like they realized that locking PvE elements, such as the unlocking of skills, um, specific armor, and this kind of stuff behind having to play through a PvE campaign, yeah, no, that's not as enjoyable either. Therefore, they separated all that stuff. They did the smart thing, and hence the game, despite the fact that, of course, now it is in maintenance mode, but that's only because of Guild Wars 2, the game is still healthy. Guild Wars is not going anywhere anytime soon, because ArenaNet made smart decisions. Whereas Bioware, yeah, not so smart. Now, people like to say, hey, you know what? You know, there, there, actually, let me let me back up a bit there. There, there's the phrase I I recently saw that said, um, "Everything happens for a reason." Now, sometimes that reason is because you are stupid and make bad decisions. Now, that's a that's a good axiom to live by, actually, as I myself um, can reflect on many bad decisions I made because I did something very stupid. Now, somehow that does not apply the realm of game development there are certain people out there in the gaming community that somehow think that developers cannot make mistakes well developers are human just like all of us and developers can make mistakes too and uh, as a matter of fact we have seen Bioware make several mistakes um, over the course of the game Excuse me, should have had a cup of water with me. Not, um, 
you know, in recent history, we've had the cartel slot machine. Now, you can say the nerf was a mistake, or the over-nerf was a mistake, but whether you like that or not, that's the fact that was released in the original state it was. was a freaking mistake! It was a stupid, bad decision! Who made that stupid, bad decision? The Bioware developers! What else do we got? The Ravager's exploit that went on for weeks, if not months! before something was done about it, which was the last, you know, that was a year ago. Another stupid bad decision by the developers. And, of course, there's been a handful more. So, yes, developers do make mistakes. Developers make bad decisions. That's why games shut down. That's why games launch in the state that they do. Now, of course, not all of that's on the developers. You know, publishers, too. Publishers, hell, more than developers make stupid, bad decisions. But, you know, everybody's human. It happens. So there have been some very bad decisions that Bioware has made in regards to 4.0. The big one, of course, this whole level sync issue. And uh, not just level sync, but this this is actually two part one. That if you watch the forums here, if you're following the forums, um, a lot of people are making a big thing out about this level sync. But there's another component to the level sync, and that's this critical story path. Now, this critical story path essentially gives you enhanced XP for just playing the class missions and the main planetary arc on each on each of the worlds that you visit as you go through your class missions. Now, this came about as a result of the popularity of the double XP weekends, which basically every MMO runs these extra XP events every once in a while. So, very popular for people who don't play as often to be able to go in and level up their character a little bit more quickly thanks to these double XP events. And, of course, that was followed by the 12x XP event which basically led up to, um, I think there was two of them. The, the real big one um, led up to, yes, because one was for a pre-order, I think, to Shadows of Revan. Um, and you got that by pre-ordering Shadows of Revan. And, of course, the other one was just given out um, in anticipation of the release of Knights of the Fallen Empire to subscribers. If you're a subscriber, you got the 12x XP. Now, along with that, the second time around, um, Bioware implemented what they call the White Acute Module, which negated that um, XP gain. Now, why would they do that? If all this enhanced XP was so loved, why would they need to put in something that would negate it? Well, maybe it's because not everybody enjoys being power leveled or super leveled. Amazing, isn't it? People like to play games differently. People, like I said at the top of the show, like to have options to play the game in the manner they most enjoy. So finally, after years of people complaining about the double XP and the 12 XP events that there was no way to opt out other than playing a max level character, if you happen to have one, or by not playing at all, they finally implement the wide acute module so people can actually play the game normally. And what's the next thing that Bioware does? They essentially make this a permanent part of the game. Not only that, but by default they shut off over half the content of the leveling game. Or, not shut off, but hide it. By default, they hide the best freaking part of the game. Pa well, part of the best part of the game. The other best part of the game, you know, the, the primary best part of the game, the class stories and the planetary arcs, they rush you through it in a matter of hours. Does that make any sense whatsoever? Now, sure, if you're on your upteenth 15 millionth character, sure, 
I completely agree that you should have the option to be able to just play the quests that you want to play through. I have no problem with that. But to force this onto every player, including new players coming into the game, where is that mass influx, by the way? I mean, the movie's been out for, what, almost three weeks now? Where are all these new people? I, th I thought the movie was supposed to bring in millions of people playing the game! Oh, well. Another, another, um, faux pas there, I guess. But anyway. Why force this on new people? Why not give people the option to be able to level at the speed they want to level it? After all, isn't that why the White Acute module was put in the game? A little bit of, some sort of little bit of effort was made to put in the NPC with the White Acute module and do all the coding that says, no, turn this crap off. A little bit of effort was made to put it in there, so it must have been slightly important. At least slightly important enough to put it in there, but then you force it all onto everybody with 4.0 with no way to turn it off? I mean, granted, the level gains aren't as big. It's, I think it, you know, by estimates, runs 6x to 8x XP. Nevertheless, it's not like the game was a terrible grind before. Oh, there goes the frothing again. Yes! This game was not very grind heavy. Shocking of shocks. The game was not overly difficult to begin with. Leveling was not that much of a chore to begin with. Shocking of shocks. If you want grind, go on the internet. Look up wizardry. Look up advanced Dungeons and Dragons, Eye of the Beholder. And, you know, Pools of Radiance, all those games. You want grind? My friends, those are the games that invented the word grind. That's grind. MMOs today? I mean, outside of the, you know, the Korean Grindfest MMOs. Anything made in the Western Hemisphere today? Grind? Grind? You're an idiot. If you think this is grind. Hear that, you're just too young. Put your diapers back on. Stay off my line, you kids. Anyway. But regardless... Regarding all that, again, I don't begrudge the fact that, yes, for certain circumstances, I have absolutely no problem with allowing people to level at the speed that they want to level. I have absolutely no problem with people buying a you know, max level character. Although some do have a problem with that, but ne never mind. It's forcing it on everybody. It's taking away an option to be able to play the game in the manner you most enjoy. You're not enhancing your game. You're not opening up your game to anybody. You're limiting your game by doing that. Now, of course, because they forced it on everybody, they had to do something to uh, mitigate the complaints about why people did not want to be over-leveled or leveling too fast. Now, they could have done it the smart way. By keeping the white acute module and allowing people to use that to turn off this extra XP gain. But no, they didn't do that. They didn't do the smart thing. They did the dumb thing. They implemented level syncing. And just like the critical story path is forced, level syncing is forced as well. And it's not like it's forced in only certain instances. It's forced throughout the whole freaking game. They've essentially made leveling in the game completely 
pointless. Now, there's been a lot of arguments back and forth about level syncing and the challenge in the game being taken away because of all these changes and the enhancements to companions to make the game a lot easier. Now, again, like I said, options are good. I have no problem with a game giving people the option to use an easy button to insta-death mobs or whatever. If somebody wants to hit an easy button and instantly complete the entire game and get every friggin' single reward, title, whatever, I don't really care. Somebody wants to hit the easy button and kill every world boss in the game and get the best loot from it, I don't really care. If that's what they want to pay their 60 bucks for, of course when the game costs 60 bucks, or if that's what they want to pay their $15 a month for, then you know what? Go knock yourself out. I don't care. Because you're not really affecting how I play the game. Now, of course, you know, World Boss is a little bit different. We'd have to do a little bit something so it doesn't affect everybody else. But the principle stands that I don't care how other people want to play the game. As long as they have the option to do it. And if that keeps them happy. And if that keeps them paying their money to keep the game funded and keep the game going. Then, gosh darn it, more power to them. They should have that ability to do it more options but again we've seen the game go less challenging faster forced xp and forced level sinking it's limiting 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 the options for people to play the game and as we can see, you know, and as we can see, they've limited the options for PvP players to enjoy the game. They've limited the options for endgame raiders to enjoy the game. And these people have left. They left the game. Now, I don't necessarily subscribe to all these doom and gloom posts of the past where say, oh, there's a mass exodus. But surely, I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that people have left the game over all these poor decisions that Bioware has made over the last few years, and in 4.0 in particular. I mean, even some of the biggest fanboys and fangirls of the game have left in the last year because of these piss-poor decisions. It just never ceases to amaze me. So yes, SWOTOR is dead because of these poor decisions. Now, level syncing in and of itself is not a bad idea. In fact, I've been a proponent of having something similar. In fact, it's been asked for in terms of having, um, you know, the, the, the phrase is different, you know, down leveling, or basically having the option to down level when you're helping a lower level person. You know, um, I forget some of the terms that people use for it at this point in time, but regardless, if implemented correctly, and that's the key, if level syncing is implemented correctly, it is a very good system to have in the game. Now, implemented correctly, you know, you can look to games like Rift or formally, uh, formally City of Heroes did it correctly. Did it in a way in which it is beneficial to the overall health of the game and overall enjoyment of the player base. The way it's implemented here, no, it is another bad decision. Why was it implemented? Well, I just talked about that. It was implemented specifically to counteract the effects of the critical story path XP gains. So people would not complain that they are out-leveling content. It doesn't make content relevant. I got news for you folks. The relevancy of content is not objective. It is completely subjective. Whether a piece of content is relevant to somebody or not. So it makes nothing relevant again. I used to play Black Talon Esseles, um on a regular basis basis with overleveled characters. The content, even though I was 10, 20, 30 levels above the recommended level for the flashpoints, was still relevant to me because I enjoyed it. 
Level syncing does not make it any more or less relevant to me. Level syncing does not make any particular zone in the planet any more or less relevant to me. If I don't want to go to some barren wasteland on Tatooine, level syncing is not suddenly going to make me want to go there. Because that little area is irrelevant to me, whether I am level synced or not. So, the fact to say that level syncing makes content relevant is completely asinine. Relevancy is in the mind of the player, not based upon some forced game mechanic. Now, what else about level syncing? The fact that you know, people say, well, it's implemented this and that. No, it was implemented because of the XP gains. That's why it was. Now, there's a lot of other side effects, you know, some beneficial, obviously others not, uh, that come from level syncing. But in and of itself, there are other elements that can be implemented that make some of the problems people have brought up solved better than this implementing of level syncing. Because obviously, as we have seen now, level syncing does not really make anything more difficult. It just makes things a little bit more tedious. You are still, essentially, if you have a high level character, you're still overpowered. I mean, all in all, if you're a level 65 character, nothing is relevant thanks to level syncing because you're not gaining any XP anyway. So it, make, it still makes the game completely irrelevant with a max level character. And it just makes things more of a headache as a leveling character is essentially all it does in this implementation. Now, some people have said, well, now you can't solo world bosses, which I agree with. I, I certainly agree that um, as a concept, world bosses should be group activity. Problem is, they haven't been a group activity for, oh, I don't know, since after the first year and a half of the game. I, mean, I remember a year and a half, two years ago, trying to get people to form up groups for world bosses. I'd sit on a planet looking at the world boss, shouting in general, shouting in global chat, telling guildies and friends, hey, go to fleet, go here, go here, tell them, hey, this world boss is up, let's come get him. Nothing. Nothing. So the fact that you can't solo a world boss, well... I mean, on principle, I agree with that, but people didn't want to group up before. Level syncing ain't going to make them group up now. Again, relevancy is in the eye of the beholder. If world bosses became irrelevant two years after the game launched, level syncing's not going to make them any more relevant. It's just going to make them a bigger pain in the ass to kill. Because at least on some occasions, as I was leveling my alts, I'd be able to get a group formed and we'd be able to pull in, at the time, you know, max level was 50, we'd be able to pull in a couple of level 50 characters and say, hey, come on, let's all kill this world boss so we can at least have a handful of people in there doing something fun together, and thanks to the level 50s, we'd have a reasonable shot at actually taking this guy down. But again, level syncing completely eliminates that option now completely eliminates the option to be able, if you can't get a full operation group together to take this guy down, hey, at least bring in a couple max level characters to give you a little bit of a crutch to hold on to. What's wrong with that? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, especially if you're a casual like I am. You know, I had a hell of a fun time taking down world bosses with, you know, like 8, 10 people with a couple of 50s in there. Hell, that was more fun than sometimes a full operation group, for God's sakes. But, whatever. Regardless, yes, it does eliminate the ability to solo world bosses. But, we don't need a carte blanche level sync to be able to do that. We don't need a carte blanche level sync to be able to go to our newbie pal who just joined our guild, who just got into the game with his level, and he's up to level 10. We don't need carte blanche to be able to take my level 65 down there to help him out. Make it situational. Make it optional. Works a lot better that way. That's a better implementation. 
because, you know, sometimes, you know, there, there's been, hell, there were points when I was leveling some alts to where, you know what, I just wanted my high-level buddy to run me through a little bit of content here. Make the trash mobs a little less tedious because, you know what, I only had 20 minutes, but I wanted to get some quest done that normally would take half an hour, 45 minutes with all the running around this and that, you know, and the trash mob killing. My level, high-level guy, hey, we did it in 20 minutes, I had a blast. Amazing I was able to have fun that way, isn't it? But I did it. Other times I did it the normal way because that's fun too. I had options. I had options to do it. Again, force carte blanche level sinking takes all those options away. Now what else was there complaints about? So yes, world bosses, yes, they should be group content. So make it situational. All the world bosses are in heroic areas. So make level sinking forced. Yes, I said forced. In certain aspects. Make it forced when you go into a heroic area. Make it forced if you have a particular um, Knights of the Fallen Empire quest active in your quest log. It doesn't need to be forced carte blanche. It can be situational. Works a lot better that way because it gives us options to be able to play how we want to play. Another complaint about was like, you know, noobs can no longer be ganked by a high old, higher level character. Well, yeah, like we just mentioned, yeah, you can still be ganked because now, instead of the high level character having to push one button to one hit you, he has to push two buttons to two hit the noob with a level sink. Yeah, that was a big problem that was solved, yes. Oh, that's big problem. Big problem solved there, yes. Good job, friends of Forest Level Sink. Yes, good job. Now, does, that does, doesn't really work. There's better ways to make it work and still keep it optional for open world PvP. There's certain things you can do, just, you know, there's certain mechanics you can do. And, and you know, all this stuff has already been mentioned on, on, on the forums you know, way before even 4.0 dropped when we finally found out about all this nonsense. You know, just make it optional to where you know what? If you're... if the level ranges are out of a certain disparity between characters, you know, the higher level guy simply cannot attack the lower level guy unless the lower level guy attacks him first. Now, if the newbie is going to attack some higher level character first, then you know what? He deserves to be one freaking hit. But the ganking, just, just you know, there's certain mechanics in play. We already have brackets for PvP in many games, including this one. You've got the lower level bracket, and then you got the max level bracket. I mean, there's no reason why you open world can't be the same way. Saying if you're more than five levels above some guy, psh, you ain't ganking him unless he hits you first. If he attacks you first, then of course he's fair game. But you can't just go out and gank dupes. No, you're too high a level. Don't even need level sync to do that, for God's sakes. Uh, of course, some um, the other problems is like you know lore wise. Well, well lore wise, you know, you know, it's like well, why is some imperial trooper on uh, Korriban any weaker than some imperial trooper out on Tatooine? I mean, they're both imperial troopers. They uh, they all went through the same training. Why should one be more powerful? Or uh, why should one be less dangerous than the other? I mean, they're just imperial troopers. You know, the level's just a number. I mean, logically speaking, or speaking, the Imperial Trooper on Korriban should just be able to kill me as easily as the one on Tatooine. Well, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, that that does make some sense. And to you uh, factor in the point, then, well, let's say my level 10 Sith Warrior, he, you know, or Jedi Knight, whoever, it doesn't matter. It's like my level 10 guy, well, he can actually handle that guy on Korriban. He goes there, he can kill him. He's trained, my, my guy's trained well enough to be able to handle himself against that guy. So, that being the case, why wouldn't my guy be able to go to Tatooine and take down that Imperial Trooper over on Tatooine then? Because you see, level sync doesn't work the other way. If I'm level 10, well, if I'm level 30 and I go to Korban and get synced down to, you know, whatever is level 10. I go to Tatooine, get synced, you know, I don't get synced up to level, you know, whatever. Or if I go to McKeb, I don't get synced up to level 50. 
So why doesn't it work that way? I mean, if we're all talking lore here, if we're all talking common sense, then my level 30 should be able to go to Makeb and kill the level 50 Imperial Trooper just as easily as he goes to Korriban and kills the level 10 Trooper, right? That's lore. That's common sense. That's real life. But no, it doesn't work that way. So, no. E e sorry. If it doesn't work up, then no way in hell should it work down. Sorry. If we're going to bring in lore and that, that friggin' asinine argument, well, then there should be no reason I can't take my level 30 to McCab and destroy everything that is a similar as the lower levels. I should be able to kill core, core slugs anywhere I go in the universe once I get my butt off Korriban and have enough training to do so, regardless of my level. Now... Some other complaint was about, well, now we don't have all these high-level characters coming down to these lower-level planets and just killing everything in sight and ruining all my fun. I uh, never realized that was a problem. Like Soul Link, I think, I think, you know, like Soul Link world bosses, which I think I've actually witnessed once in the four years I was playing the game, I saw one person solo a world boss. Just like that. It's like, I've never been on a lower level planet and, and all of a sudden found myself with nothing to kill while I was leveling because some high level, level player just ran through and just killed everything in sight. Never once did that ever happen. You know what happened? You know the times I ran into trouble trying to complete some of these uh, this, uh, yeah, bonus quests and uh, you know the, the the kill trash mob quests. You know where I ran into trouble doing that? When there was a whole bunch of other people my level doing the same damn thing. In in one particular note, one of the heroics on uh, Coruscant that happened. Um, you go into the area with the, the medical center or whatever, and of course the the the, the bonus quest is kill all these guys. They're in the, the general area of the medical center. Well, it took me an hour to do that because there are about five, six, seven other people doing the same damn thing. They weren't all high level. None of them were high. They were all my level. Level sinking ain't going to change that now, is it? And in fact, again, as we see, level sinking ain't going to prevent some higher level player from coming down and ganking anything anyway. So we got another asinine argument. For making it forced. Sorry. You're an idiot. There's no reason for it to be forced. Level syncing is a good idea if implemented correctly. This is a poor implementation. It needs to be optional. There are much better ways to handle these supposed issues that people somehow bring up that have never been issues before level syncing ever was mentioned. Somehow, all of a sudden, oh, all these things are problems? I don't know. I played the game pretty heavily for four years. Never never saw any of these problems myself. I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe I just don't pay enough attention to the game. I don't know about that. That's There it is. 4.0. Take it or leave it. I've chosen to leave it because it just... No, I prefer to level at my own pace. I prefer to be able to make my own challenge... Oh, yes, that's another thing. The challenge of the game. Oh, here we go. The challenge of the game. The game is so simple now. It's for casuals. Again, I have no problem with, a, like I said, a game having an easy button to, for people to do wherever they want. This We are in the market of the casuals. The gaming community is casual now. I used to be a hardcore player. I've accepted the fact that the entire industry, because the entire society is more geared to casual stuff, I am perfectly fine with that. Just give us the option. Now, uh, what brings this up is this little ditty right here. This post here by good old Lord Artemis. Okay, now I, I like Lord Artemis, or L.A. as he's affectionately called. He's got some good ideas. I don't always agree with him. But he's, uh... 
he's one of those that actually does have some common sense within the forums here, however, the point he brings up about the challenge here, um, th this post he made um, right after Christmas, um, about how to tailor the challenge of SWOTOR 4.0 um, more to your liking for people who want more of a challenge. Uh, which, uh, let me get, scroll down here a bit here, too. Tips to make the gameplay more challenging here. Now, this is the thing that a, a lot of these people who are proponents for some of these changes that Bioware has made, as stupid as they are. Um, to me, LA's post here really highlights it. The trick here to, is to avoid doing the planetary arcs. If you concentrate only on the class quest, you will consistently find yourself three to four levels below the content, eventually reaching the point at the end where the content will be quite a challenge. Uh, avoid using presence buffs, obviously. Even with legacy Datacron and gear drops. is uh, Of course, gear, you can always lower gear yourself. It's obviously important to avoid any secondary content, like flashpoints and or heroics, before you finish the class story. Focus on the class storyline while you are leveling. Any other tips are welcome. Now, of course, one of, uh, one of the most obvious tips that he uh, doesn't mention here, but is mentioned quite frequent, frequently um, on the forums, which I think uh, we even is even mentioned here, um, level sync needs an off button. Oh, good old Rata Jack. We'll talk about him in a moment. Uh, but one other thing that is um, mentioned, isn't that LA doesn't mention, but is mentioned quite frankly, is dismiss your companion. So, uh, let, let's get back to that real quick here. So, in essence here, avoid doing planetary arcs. Uh, avoid using any buffs or, or any of the extras that the game has uh, or offers you during gameplay. Um, take lesser gear. Um, don't upgrade your gear. Um, avoid any secondary content. Dismiss your companions. So essentially... For people who, again, now, I'm a, I'm a casual player. I used to be hardcore. I'm, ca I'm casual all the way now. Um, so, essentially, the, the only way to make a game challenging is to pretty much eliminate or avoid doing 90% of the content, 95% of the content. Does that seriously make any sense to anybody? Does anybody seriously consider that good game design? If you want a challenge, skip 95 freaking percent of the game. What the hell am I paying my money for then? I mean, how anybody can seriously consider this good game design well obviously that's why 99% of gamers don't make games because of sheer idiocy like this and now, and now this is not against LA because he does further on in this you know later on in this post he does qualify what he's saying I mean, he 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 doesn't agree with some of the implementations either. So this this isn't actually against LA, but but the concept here of having to do something extraordinary in order to enjoy a game that is completely baffling to me. In fact, here I think uh, this next guy here actually does it a little bit in a more sarcastic way. Do not try any PvP 
PvP content, do not do any missions, do not try group content, do not ever try Planet Story arcs again. You know, he's being a little bit tongue-in-cheek sarcastic, but it makes out the point to where, you know, e yeah. This, is, like I said, this is a casual industry we are in now. And there's nothing wrong with that because the industry needs to make money. The industry needs to be profitable and casual is the way to go. But again, you have to be smart about how you do it with your game. Again, that that little axiom I mentioned earlier in the in the show. You know, sometimes things happen because you make stupid bad decisions. There's nothing wrong with giving an option for people to play the game um, on easy mode. Let's just put that way. Did do it on easy mode. I don't have a problem with that. But to do it in the manner to where you all of a sudden force everybody into that mode of playing they have no other no other options but to play in easy mode just as bad as forcing everybody into the critical path and forcing everybody into level sync now just like i've said um let's see here about level sync having to roll my bad hand you know here people are you know again this is basically everything i went over with level sync i was probably going to refer to this, but I think I've said everything I needed to say about the idiocy of level sync. Although Ratajack here says something about effort does not have to be physically, mentally mentally taxing or anything like that. It's about effort. So what Ratajack here is equating that people who want optional level sync and he mentions here, well, at least one person in this very thread who demands be able to do everything without level sync while receiving the same rewards as those who are level sync. Now, that's not what I'm talking about. Obviously, I completely disagree with whoever this player is he's referring to. I would be perfectly happy to have an optional level sync, um, whereas, uh, whereby if I turn off level sync, I am playing... Uh, SWOTOR prior to 4.0. Vanilla. Let's just call it Vanilla SWOTOR at this point. I'd be perfectly happy doing that. I'd love to be able to go into Esselies again, especially now that we have this, um, the, um, the, the outfit designer and shit. I would be perfectly happy to turn off level sync and go to Esselies and get some of the equipment that is Esselies specific, which of course now is gone because they eliminated all that stuff. I mean, that's another very poor decision right there, especially with the implementation of the outfit designer to where now you can actually use all these old, old, outdated, low-level pieces to make your character the way you want to look. Now, they just eliminate it all. Another stupid, poor decision. But Christ, this, this episode's already going on long enough about the stupid, poor decisions of Bioware. But anything, it's not an aversion to effort. I mean, sure, absolutely, there are some people like this guy he mentions who wants things handed to him on a silver platter. I don't necessarily agree with, and, you know, sure, hey, if this guy wants, like I said, if this person wants an easy button, then more power to him, because he doesn't affect my gameplay, I really don't care. I don't necessarily agree with, uh, agree with this, because if we make it optional, we do have to have certain limitations. And one of them I would agree, you don't get the same rewards. I, I'd be, like I said, perfectly happy just to have, you know, the vanilla gameplay experience with the, the rewards that were offered beforehand. But it's not an aversion to effort, but, I mean, at least on my part, it's being able to tailor my gameplay experience to be one that I enjoy the most. Sure, I love steamrolling low-level mobs every once in a while. I find that great fun to face roll a keyboard against some chlor slug that kicked my butt when I was level 1 Sith Warrior Padawan. I find that great fun, especially after a hard day of real life, to go in and say, yeah, what well, chlor slug, take this lightsaber right up on Wazoo! Sure, I love one-hitting things, but in, that that's but I don't need to play like that all the time. I mean that's fun once in a while. But what's really fun to me is being able to t 
tailor my gameplay experience from moment to moment. If I run into something that's a little bit more difficult, I want to be able to level up maybe one or two levels. That gives me that little bit of edge to be able to uh, defeat a particular foe or something. That's what I find most enjoyable, that force level sync completely eliminates. And that's essentially why I have been finished with the game, among other things. Again, Bioware's poor decisions in communicating with the player base and their poor decisions and absolutely horrid testing and vetting procedures, which has allowed a lot of these poor decisions to make it into live, have been other reasons why, but essentially that's that, that's that's what it is there. It's um it's just one poor decision after another that unfortunately I mean there, there there's not a lot of them but the poor decisions they have made have really I mean to me been have come at critical moments and are about critical features that really outweigh a lot of the good decisions and good implementations that Bioware has actually made especially with 4.0 again like I said 4.0 I thought, you know, their return to focus is storytelling. I think the whole concept here of what they're doing, not necessarily how they're putting it behind a paywall and basically turning this back into a subscription game, I don't think that's a great idea. But again, what, do, what can they do? Essentially, what can they do, really, when you're giving away the best part of your game was the 1 to 50 leveling experience? When you're giving that away for free, you've got to be able to do something to make money on a consistent basis. Now, I would subscribe to the theory that if you make a fun, engaging game and you have a good cash shop, people are going to pay money in that cash shop. Regardless, you don't necessarily need to force them into a pay gate subscription-based model to experience further story content. But regardless, that's, that's a minor issue I have with it. Overall, I think what they have done is a good idea. They have just made some very, very poor decisions surrounding the good idea that really takes away from all the good that they have done and and ultimately hurts the game. Does nothing to enhance or increase the player experience and does nothing to maintain um, a stable player base. That's the big problem there. And hence, why at this point, you know, SWOTOR the MMO is dead. And unfortunately, unless Bioware does something very quickly to rectify that, I mean, we, w we essentially do see um, a limited lifespan for this game. Now, there's, there's, there's games out there that have been, you know, MMOs out there that have been around for 20 years. Still, I mean, are, are they great models of gaming development? Are they great models of profit profitability? Not necessarily. But they're doing something that people enjoy playing. And because they're doing something that a core group of people enjoy playing, they're able to continue to be funded by those people and continue to exist in a market where MMOs are, you know, a dime a dozen and, you know, as many shut down as light up, essentially, you know, at this point in time. So for a game to, for developers to make some decisions that actually limit um, how many people want to come in and play your game and continue to play your game year after year is quite puzzling to me. And unfortunately, as much as I'd love to see SWOTOR have a lifespan like some of these other games, have a lifespan that you can pretty much guarantee to see Guild Wars have. I mean, Guild Wars is going on 11 years at this point. It's only a, few, a couple months away from its 11th birthday. And again, you know, does it have the player base it wants to? No, of course not. Is it in maintenance mode? Yes, of course. But the fact that it is in maintenance mode and still has a, pre a pretty sizable um, player base, still playing it on a regular basis, not to mention that, I mean, they, they still have their holiday events and, and special events that bring in hordes and hordes of players. 
um, and there's communities in Facebook uh, there's communities on Facebook and and other places that are still dedicated to a game that is actually you know over a decade old at this point you know that's that's longevity that's making right decisions at right moments um, although I don't, you know, yeah, I've mentioned this, I think, before. I don't always agree, you know, especially in my Tyrion Adventures episodes. I don't always agree with er- what ArenaNet has done um, in some instances, but they have made the right decisions. I mean, whether it be how they communicate with the player base, um, how they implement things, this and that, that will give the game longevity um, up through its 11th year, its 12th year. I, I mean, we will probably... I, I would go out on a limb and venture to say we will still be talking about Guild Wars. We will still be playing Guild Wars. Even after WoW. Even after we're talking about WoW's servers being shut down and WoW, you know, being gone. I would go out on a limb and venture to say that we will still see Guild Wars, the original Guild Wars, up and running because of the development of the game and the developers and their ideas and their philosophies. Here with with SWOTOR, I I hate to say it, but I just don't see that with SWOTOR. And and essentially, it all comes down to um, one final point on that. Um, The reasoning behind what Bioware claims they did with 4.0 and that's the metrics now this has been bounced around a lot on the forums and by Bioware themselves about the metrics about about what players have been doing which has led them to make the design decisions they did now to paraphrase Yoda um, metrics that misread could have been Metrics are a good thing to have. Like anybody who's in the business can tell you metrics and dynamics and that kind of stuff are good things to have. But metrics are a lot like political polls. They can be interpreted in many different ways and not all of them the right way. And I think that's part of the problem we have seen here with Bioware. They have made some decisions in the past that have skewed their metrics to lead them to believe that some of the decisions they made were the right ones when in fact they were the wrong ones. So I think the meaning is somewhat obvious in that in uh, with that um, in that you can spin um, a political poll uh, based on how the questions are phrased and all that kind of stuff to basically reflect whatever answer you want that poll to reflect. Uh, metrics are sort of the same way. The, the numbers, the values you get back from those metrics in and of themselves um, don't really tell the whole story. Um, they really only become important, they really only become valuable when you understand what's going on behind those numbers. And I think that's something that Bioware doesn't necessarily get at this point. Um, And uh, part of that is because, like I mentioned earlier, why would you institute the white acute module and then turn around um, and force the enhanced XP system on everybody? I mean, there was a reason why the white acute module was needed or desired. And I think, you know, Bioware sort of missed missed that. And obviously they missed it when they, they forced the XP gains on everybody and used Level Sync as a solution to it. When, you know, it was obvious that the White Acute module did the job that people wanted it to do. So the same thing with the metrics. I don't think Bioware understands completely completely why people are doing what they're doing to give them the metrics they're getting. So, um, 
because I've been, I, I mean, this episode, I've obviously gone on and on because it's something I'm passionate about. Because um, it's a game I'm passionate about. It's something I want to see succeed. And unfortunately, I just don't see it doing that any longer based on some of the decisions they've made with 4.0. So, in terms of metrics, let's say I have a game. I've developed a game. Let's say I want to see what people are doing in that game. Uh, uh, what they're playing and how they're playing it. Well, let's say this game has a good PvP, a PvE element. Let's say just say it's got a good PvP element. And it's, let's say it's got good end game elements. Now let's say over the course of the year, I've neglected the development of that PvP element. And I've neglected the development of that end game element. So what's going to happen? Naturally, people who enjoy those parts of the game are eventually going to get tired and stop doing it. They're either going to leave or they're just going to do what's been getting developed more or less. Let's just say I've been focusing a little bit more on enhancing the PvE element of the game. So when I go to run my metrics for my game, it tells me, well, the majority of the people are just playing regular PvE. They're not doing a whole heck of a lot of PvP. They're not doing a whole heck of a lot of endgame raiding. So if I just look at the raw numbers, it's telling me, oh, well, 90% of my player base is just doing leveling in PvE. Well, why is that? Is it because they actually enjoy that part of the game? Or is it because I've neglected the other two-thirds of my game? Well, that's something to think about. So perhaps the metrics that Bioware has are turning out the numbers and the values that these metrics are turning out because of reasons that are pretty much obvious at this point in time. So, what do you think? Leave a comment below. Comment in the forums. I know. Let's, let's talk about it. Let's try to make uh, the title not mean what it really means. Until next time, this is BJ Wilder saying thanks for listening, thanks for watching, and until next time, I will see you in game.